today. Hello, gang. Arch. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Vancouver South. Uh, before I begin, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, that we are on the unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. This is my video update on this Thursday morning, March the 28th. Let's talk about some news. And let's start things off with my video update from yesterday, where I kind of got it wrong. I think I messed up on my video update yesterday. And I said that the UN Security Council resolution on, uh, on Israel and Gaza was non-binding. And the resolution is non-binding from the US is viewpoint. The resolution is binding from pretty much every other country's legal viewpoint. And I'm going to, to read you an article from CNN, which actually does a pretty good job discussing whether the UN Security Council resolution is binding or not binding. And uh, I discussed this with Alexander yesterday on uh, the Duran's live stream with David Sachs. So definitely go to that live stream from yesterday. And it's towards the end of the stream where I ask Alexander about the UN uh, Security Council resolution, whether it's binding or non-binding. Alexander gave his uh, point of view. Uh, he's a legal uh, expert. I am not. Just a guy with, uh, with a very nice, very nice Duran hoodie, walking walk the streets of Cyprus with a camera. But um, Alexander gave his uh, his um, opinion on uh, on whether this resolution is binding or non-binding, and uh, it's definitely worth worth a watch. I'll put a link to that live stream in the description box down below. But uh, let me read you what CNN says about this uh, Security Council resolution. Uh, Non-binding if you're the United States, binding if you're pretty much everybody else. So let me read you this excerpt from this CNN article. Experts say whether a resolution is binding depends on the language used as ambiguous language leaves room for interpretation. In this case, there have been differing opinions on whether the resolution falls under Chapter 6 of the UN Charter, deeming it non-binding, or Chapter 7, binding. This resolution demands a ceasefire. The U.S. ascribing to a legal tradition that takes a narrower interpretation argues that without the use of the word decides or evocation of Chapter 7 within the text, the resolution is non-binding said Maya Ungar, an analyst monitoring the UN Security Council developments at the International Crisis Group, ICG, a Brussels-based think tank. Other member states and international legal scholars are arguing that there is a legal precedence to the idea that a demand is implicitly a decision of the council. The crux of the issue is language of the resolution and the way that member states are interpreting the charter differently, she added. The U.S. is attempting to walk a fine line between criticizing and supporting Israel, Unger said, by arguing that the resolution is non-binding. It seems that the U.S. made a calculation that they could make a public statement by not vetoing without facing too much Israeli backlash. So the, the issue hinges on the use of the word demands demands an immediate ceasefire. And according to the U.S., using the word demands this does not mean that this resolution is binding. China, for example, is arguing that the resolution is absolutely binding and uh, demands means that a decision has been taken. The U.S. is saying basically what the U.S. is arguing 
they're taking a very narrow approach and and this uh this think tank analyst explains why the u.s is is doing this they're trying to walk that fight that fine line uh, but uh, the U.S. is basically saying that if the resolution said, use the words, for example, uh, the, the U.N. has decided on, a, on an immediate ceasefire instead of the U.N. demands an immediate ceasefire. If they use the wording, the U.N. decides on an immediate ceasefire, then it would be uh, binding. Or if they had, uh, if they had added Chapter 7 into the resolution, which chapter seven calls for the, for the UN, the UN Security Council to take action. Without chapter seven and without using the word decides, the United States is arguing that this resolution is non-binding. So I hope that clears things up and I apologize to everyone if I made a mistake on my analysis and uh, Definitely go check out, once again, definitely go check out the live stream on the Duran channel with uh, David Sachs and Alexander explains the binding, non-binding issue really well. Well, let me tell you what, uh, what Netanyahu, before we get to, to the next topic, let me tell you what Netanyahu said about uh, the cancellation of the Israeli delegation trip to the United States, here is what Netanyahu said. I thought the U.S. decision in the Security Council was a very, very bad move, the Israeli Prime Minister said. The worst part about it was that it encouraged Hamas to take a hard line and to believe that international pressure will prevent Israel from freeing the hostages and destroying Hamas. The decision not to send the delegation to Washington was a message to the Palestinian militant group, Netanyahu explained. So that's his explanation as to why he canceled the Israeli delegation trip to the Biden White House. So let's uh, let's now move on to Russian President Vladimir Putin's trip, his first trip since his reelection to the Tver region, where he visited an air base. And he made some very interesting statements. And let's start off with what let's start off with what Putin said about a possible Russia conflict with NATO. And Putin said this, and I quote, they, in reference to NATO, they came right up to our borders. Did we move to, to the borders of those countries that were part of the NATO bloc? We didn't touch anyone. They were moving towards us. Have we crossed the ocean to the borders of the United States? No, they are coming up to us and have come right up to us. As for the allegations that we are planning to invade Europe after Ukraine, this is utter nonsense, meant solely to intimidate their population, to make them pay more money, Putin said. He noted that this narrative unfolds amid the slumping economy and deteriorating living standards. This is absolutely clear and is acknowledged by everyone. This is not propaganda. This is what is really happening. They need to justify themselves so they are intimidating their population with a potential Russian threat while seeking to expand their dictation onto the entire world, Putin said. 100% spot on from Putin. That is exactly why the European Union is talking up a Russian threat to Europe, a Russian invasion into Europe. It is because the European Union wants more power. They want to centralize more power and more control. We've talked about this on this channel uh, a whole bunch. We've talked about this on the Duran a whole bunch. 
uh, defense, a defense uh, industry in the European Union, an EU army, which will be something like an EU National Guard, uh, more military spending, military budget, an EU defense commissioner, war bonds, euro bonds, direct taxation, and all of this because of Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. That is why the EU has to do all of this. That is why the EU is demanding more centralized power to Brussels, to Ursula von der Pirate. That is what this is all about. And Putin, Putin is, uh, Putin is watching the Duran. <laughs> Maybe. Who knows? Possibly. All right. Uh, Putin then talked about the F-16s. And this was, this was really interesting. Putin's statement about the F-16s to the Alensky regime, the the wonder weapon. Awesome. Awesome car. Nice BMW. Um, the wonder weapon of the F-16s that that Kuleba told Politico will, will change the, the game. The F-16s are the next wonder weapon. And Putin said, nope, <laughs> they are going to make Zero difference. Zero. Putin said that uh, that the F-16s are going to be no different than, than the Leopards and the Javelins and the Javelinas and the, uh, what else, the, the HIMARS and the ghost drones and the, the ghosts of Kiev's and the goats of Kiev and the Snake Islands, it's going to make no difference. The F-16s are not going to be a wonder weapon. And, uh, and then Putin said that the F-16s will be shot down. They will all be shot down by the Russian military. Quote, naturally, if they are used from airfields of third countries, they will be a legitimate target for us, no matter where they might be. Now, a lot of people are talking about his statement about shooting down F-16s wherever they may be. And there could be, there could be an interpretation from Putin's statement that he's also talking about the airfields. So if the F-16s take off from say Romania, well, that makes the airfield in Romania a legitimate target. I actually went to TASS to the TASS website, the Russian, the Russian language TASS websites. I'm, I'm actually taking this quote that I read you from TASS News, but the English translation. In the TASS Russian uh, website, uh, the, the statement from Putin actually says the F-16 fighter planes, if they are used from airfields of third countries, will be a legitimate target. So they actually start off the statement with uh with the words uh the fighter planes the f-16 fighter planes so i believe what putin is saying here is that the f-16 planes whether they're piloted piloted by ukraine pilots whether they're piloted by romanian american british polish once they enter the the theater the theater of the of conflict then the russians are going to shoot them down whether it's american pilots or british pilots or french pilots doesn't matter. I don't believe right now, at least with this statement, I don't believe Putin is talking about actually hitting airfields where the F-16s could be taking off from, which could very well be uh, Romania. That is very possible. But I could be wrong about this, but that's the way that I interpreted it. Actually, let me see if I've Give me one second. I think I actually bookmarked the TASS quote and ran it and ran it through a translation. Yes, from so TASS is saying this from uh, Putin's statement. F-16 fighters will become a legitimate target for Russia if they are used against the Russian armed forces from airfields of third countries, wherever they are located. So that's from TASS, Russian language, run through Yandex translation. So that was his statement on the F-16s. 
he also said that the F-16s, the big concern about the F-16s, or one of the very big concerns about uh, these fighter jets is that they can carry nuclear weapons. F-16s can carry nuclear weapons, and we must take this into account while planning combat operations. That's the part that really worries me. Uh, F-16 wonder weapon, I think the Russians are going are gonna to knock those F-16s down. But uh, F-16s carrying nukes, that, that worries me. That really, really worries me, and that's, that's a huge, that could be a huge uh, escalation. But, but we're not there yet. We still don't even have the F-16s uh, to Ukraine just yet. So let's wait and see. Uh, Putin is, is giving out warnings. And if I was the collective West, if I was NATO, if I was Romania, I would uh, I would heed those warnings. And then Putin said that uh, Russia, Russia does not have enemies in the West or the citizens of the collective West are not Russia's enemies. Russia's enemies in the collective West are the globalist elite, the elite class. Those are the enemies of Russia. He said, we do not have unfriendly nations. We have unfriendly elites in those nations, the president said, adding that the Russian government has never tried to cancel any foreign artists or cultural performances. On the contrary, we believe the Russian culture to be part of the global one, and we take pride in this fact. The Russian authorities seek to take the global cultural context into account and exclude nothing, he continued. Those seeking to abolish the culture of a nation inhabited by some 190 million people are not wise, the president said, referring to the Western actions during the Ukraine conflict. He actually made the statement uh, in, uh, in Tver, in the region, as he, was, uh, as he left the air base and he was speaking to, uh, to artists in the region. So that was his statement there. I like that statement. We don't have uh, unfriendly nations. We have no problem with the citizens of, of any nation. Our problem is with the elite. Interesting statement from Russian President Vladimir, Vladimir Putin. Now let's talk about, or let's do an update on the, on the Moscow terrorist attack. And we have two statements. One from Maria Zaharova, who gave an interview to Sputnik and a statement from Dmitry Peskov, who also gave an interview to the Russian news outlet Izvestia. And let's start off with what Zaharova said to, to Sputnik News. She said the very fact that within the first 24 hours after the attack, even before the fire was put out, the Americans started screaming that it wasn't Ukraine, I think is a piece of incriminating evidence. I can't classify it otherwise. It is evidence in and of itself. The second fact to note concerns the clamor by the U.S. that this assuredly was not the work of ISIS. Zakharova emphasized, of course, the speed with which they were able to come to such a forthright conclusions is astonishing. It took them only a few hours to get to a microphone turn on the lights, summon the press, and draw a conclusion about who is to blame for this horribly bloody terrorist attack. So that's the statement from Maria, from Maria Zaharova. Peskov pretty much said the same exact thing in his statements to Izvestia. He said, it's strange to say the least that the Americans have dared to announce a single narrative. Peskov told the Russian outlet Izvestia on Wednesday, this suggests at the very least that they are trying to shift attention away from something, he added. Peskov also noted that these claims came in before Moscow had formulated an official version of events since Russian law enforcement is still working on the case. They're both saying the same exact thing. How did the United States come to this conclusion so quickly? When even uh, Russia, when even the Russian investigation had not uh, come out with any statements, how did the U.S. come to this, to this conclusion that it was ISIS? How did the U.S. come to the conclusion that Ukraine was absolutely not involved in any of this? 
So they're both saying the same thing. They're both, uh, they're both looking at, at Ukraine involvement. I think that's obvious at this point. Uh, the entire uh, Russian um, Putin administration, they are focusing on, uh, on some sort of, of a Ukrainian component or Ukraine involvement in this terrorist attack. And uh, they're asking questions of the Biden White House. How did you know so many things? How did you come up with so many quick conclusions? And why are you trying to, to protect Ukraine? Why are you trying to cover for Ukraine? That's, that's, that's what they're saying. Zakharova, Peskov, Medvedev, Putin, the FSB director, Patrushev. We know where this is heading. I think we, we have a pretty, pretty good understanding where all of this is, is going. And if I was, uh, if I was Budanov or if I was the, the head of the SBU, what's that guy's name, Malyuk, if I were any of these guys, I would probably be asking Alensky to, to fire me as well so I could, so I could be appointed as, as ambassador to, to the UK or something like that because I think that, uh, that Russia is going to be looking at, at the SBU and uh, military intelligence for this uh, terrorist attack. But the investigation is still ongoing, so uh, let's wait and see. And, and actually, actually, the SBU head, this guy, Maliuk, who, who really was not a very high-profile uh, um, individual, he, he wasn't really giving so many interviews and wasn't really talking to the media, at least not that I know of. It was always Danilov and, uh, and especially Budanov. But now this guy is, he's, he's talking now. He is talking and he gave an interview to Ukraine media yesterday. And uh, this guy, this guy must not be the sharpest knife in the, in the drawer because he was telling the media that the SBU is absolutely conducting operations in uh, Russia to go after uh, Ukrainians and Russians who are uh, who are helping Russia in this uh, in this conflict instead of lying low this guy's doing the exact op opposite he's actually going on TV he's speaking to Ukraine media and he's saying yeah we are conducting operations to go after Russians and Ukrainians who are aiding uh, Russia. We have operations targeting these people. Anyway, that's what uh, that's what this guy said. Mal Maliuk, remember that name? I think Vasily, Vasily, Vasily Mal Maliuk. Anyway, let's uh, let's now talk about about NATO and whether NATO is ready for war with Russia. So yesterday in my clown world, I highlighted an article from the always reliable news outlet in the UK known as The Telegraph. And uh, they had an article talking about how if, uh, if NATO did go to war with Russia, then even without the United States, NATO would win. It's just that simple. Even if the US decided to sit this war out, NATO without the U.S. could still take on Russia. It could still win because, because NATO's awesome. It's awesome. Awesome tech, awesome combined arms warfare, and awesome uh, military, awesome equipment, tanks, and missiles, and fighter jets. It's just awesome. And, and Russia was no match for for Snake Island and, uh, and the ghost of Kiev, so it would be no match for the power of NATO, even without the United States. And, and uh, we have some comments about whether NATO would be, would be ready for a war with Russia. And we have a statement from the Prime Minister of Latvia, who said, while she was in Germany visiting Pirate Schultz, the Prime Minister of Latvia, Selina, said that NATO is not ready to go to war with Russia. Yeah, they're not ready, said the Latvian Prime Minister. With regard to the troops, I do not think that this initiative 
was very well prepared because the discussion about this has not yet matured. Speaking about sending troops, I think we in NATO are not ready to do this, the Latvian prime minister stated in a joint press conference with Pirate Schultz, our matey, I'm Pirate Schultz. <laughs> Pirate Schultz with the Latvian prime minister. She pointed out that Kiev has not asked NATO states to send troops and emphasized that we need to focus on Ukraine's needs, not what Ukraine isn't asking for. And then we had a statement from a UK military official who said that the UK, if it were to fight Russia, and this article, by the way, was from The Telegraph. This was actually published in The Telegraph. And uh, this UK military official said that if the UK was to go to war with Russia, it would last for a total of two months. Two months. Would it last for two months? Or is that being too too generous. I don't know. I don't know. But he says two months. That's how long the UK military would last in a fight with Russia. From the Telegraph, UK military couldn't fight Russia for longer than two months. Failure to secure more funding for armed forces puts us at a disadvantage, warns Deputy Chief of Defense Staff. Lieutenant General Sir Rob McGowan said the armed forces would have to manage the operational risk that came with not having the resources he would like in future wars. It comes after Grant Shapps, the defense secretary, told MPs that he had lobbied Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt for more money to be spent on defense in the recent budget, but failed to secure an increase. That's right. It's all about money. It's all about the money, money, money. And uh, yeah, the UK, if it wants to take on Russia in a war, it needs more money. Otherwise, it won't last for two months. So, so let's get that money to the MIC, everybody. Let's get that money to the military industrial complex ASAP so that the UK can fight the Russians for more than two months. Alensky was in the Sumi region, which, which is right, right on the border, Kharkov Sumi region, where where the thinking is that sooner or later Russia is going to create uh, a big, a big fat buffer zone. But uh, Elensky was there, and he was uh, taking a look at the the defense lines, the fortifications in Sumy. Ukraine's Sudovikin line is what's going on in the Sumy region. Now here's. Here's a Twitter ex post from Olga Bazova, who says, in good tradition, Alensky has visited the fortifications that are being built around the Sumy region, as he previously visited Avdevka, Lizichansk, Solidar, and Bakhmut. And we all know what happened to all of those regions, cities, towns, villages. Every time Alensky visits a region or a city or a village or a town, what happens? That town eventually falls to the Russian military. It's kind of like an offshoot of the Alensky curse. It's, it's, it's a geographic, a geographic component to the Alensky curse. And I have to say that watching the video of Alensky um, inspecting the, the fortifications, he, he looks very confused. <laughs> he has this confused look on his face as he's taken a tour of the fortifications and he's shown diagrams and maps and rooms and uh and Delensky's, he, he kind of looks out of it. it it seems like he's not understanding exactly what all of this is for <laughs> you know he's like looking at the at the maps and he's and he's listening to, to everyone explain to him what what all of this stuff is all of these rooms and, and all of these trenches and he has this look on his face like uh, uh, is is this a uh, is this a home tour? Are you showing me new, uh, new home, uh, home uh, property complex that I will buy? What's going on here? <laughs> you know, he has this, this look on his face like, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> I don't know. That's, that's kind of the look that I, that I see from uh, Aletsky. Anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about uh, Biden. 
clown world, clown world. Let's talk about Biden. And Biden was in, where was Biden? Where was Joe Bidenopolis? Greece is favorite son. He was in Raleigh, North Carolina on Tuesday. And he was giving a speech in Raleigh. And he advocated for raising the average federal tax for America's wealthiest from 8.2% to 20, 25%, arguing that this would allow Washington to raise $400 billion over the next 10 years. Okay, he wants to raise the tax on, uh, on the wealthy from 8.2% to 25%. All right. And, uh, and, then, and, then, uh, and then Biden said this about Putin. I don't know how Putin fits into this, but anyway, this is what he said as he's talking about raising the tax. Imagine what we could do with that. We could fundamentally slash the federal deficit. We could do so many things, consequential, including finally making sure that we take care of Ukraine from that butcher, Putin. <laughs> that Putin lives in Biden's head rent free. <laughs> Rent free, bro. <laughs> Man, Biden is so jealous of Putin. He really is so jealous of Putin. Putin's on his mind 24 7. Well, Putin and Trump, but I, I really believe that Putin occupies more of, of Biden's brain power. <laughs> I don't know, I guess. I think that he, he occupies more of Biden's brain power than, uh, than Trump. But uh, wow, he's talking about raising taxes on the wealthiest. And uh, he says that if we raise taxes on the wealthiest, you know, we can we can use that money not to, I don't know, uh, maybe we could use that money for education, health care, the border, homeless, uh, maybe infrastructure, uh, maybe infrastructure, Biden. Uh, no, no, no. We can use the money that we raise, that we, that we raise from, uh, from taxes to, to, to stick it to Putin. <laughs> I mean, uh, and he calls Putin a butcher. Like a month ago, he called Putin an SOB or like two months ago. Now Putin's the butcher. The butcher, like in uh, like in Gangs of New York. Bill, Bill the Butcher, Daniel Day-Lewis. Remember that role? Of, uh, was it Bill, Bill the Butcher? Was that his, his character's name? What a, what a great uh, character that was. What a great actor, Daniel Day-Lewis, huh? Probably the greatest actor of our generation. Well, that, that's what I think of when I hear the the butcher this this leader is the butcher i always think of gangs of new york <laughs> and daniel day lewis <laughs> oh boy biden just stop man just just stop with this just just don't you know uh, <laughs> just biden should not be should not be allowed to to speak so freely <laughs> because he always says just crazy stuff man xi jinping's a dictator putin's an sob Putin's a butcher. Yeah, that's what that's what Biden wants to use the four hundred the four hundred billion that the U.S. gets from raising taxes. He wants to use it on Ukraine, which I guess I guess is a way of Biden saying that the the money could get could get washed and come back to to the political elite's pockets <laughs> or, or go to the military industrial complex. I guess that that's what Biden is 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 really meaning when. When he says that the 400 billion could be used for uh, for Ukraine and used to to get to the butcher Putin. Anyway, uh, Biden is jealous. He's very jealous of Putin. Um, Biden, by the way, he uh, there was a book on Biden. There was a book on Biden, not his book, but there was a book on Biden, which is now canceled. Simon and Schuster withdraws a contract for a major book about Biden's presidency after a lack of market interest no one's interested in reading about biden's presidency that would that would be an interesting book <laughs> i must admit a book on biden's presidency <laughs> that would be an interesting book 
<laughs> All right. That's the that's the video, everybody. The Duran.locals.com. We are on Rumble, Odyssey, Bit Shoot, Telegram, Rockfin, and Twitter X. And go to the Duran shop. And uh, go to the Duran shop and go to to the reverse gear. One sec. Go to the reverse gear shop as well. Reverse gear dot shop or Duran shop. Take care. <laughs>